Hey guys, welcome to this week's Money and Investing Show. This week we are talking about international markets. This is an area that so many investors shun away from, perceiving it as being more difficult or maybe not tax friendly or indeed logistically quite challenging. It doesn't have to be that way. Make sure you go through this podcast and take plenty of notes, but most importantly, make sure you take plenty of action. Hey guys, welcome to this week's Money and Investing Show with me, your host, Andrew Baxter, and as always, my offsider and co-host, Mitchell Lorenzo. Get out of town, AB, literally today, because we're going to be talking about international markets. How's that for a segue? It is terrible. It's entry level, but it's good. You're growing slowly. That's right. It is what it is. Now, today, getting onto the matter at hand, we're going to be talking about investing outside of our local market. A lot of investors probably don't realize there are so many more opportunities out there abroad. You just got to know how to do it. Indeed, it's uh, it's there is a world of opportunity out there, and and when you look at the traditional financial planning model, for example, if you have a exposure to the stock market through a financial planner, they probably go, oh, we'll have sixty percent Aussie exposure, it's nice and low risk, and a bit of forty percent overseas, which you know, when you consider Australia is about what two percent of the world economy, or certainly less than two percent of the global stock exchange, gives you this colossal overweight position towards a very very small market versus you know, a lack of exposure to some of the other opportunities that sit there. And, uh, and I think you'd almost argue the inverse would be a better way to, to go. And maybe at the end of this podcast, the listeners might think the same. Oh, yeah. Well, I know firsthand, anecdotally speaking, with our trading here at AIE, so many more of our recommendations are in the US mm. versus Australia. Better liquidity, better options, more stocks to trade. It just makes sense from, a, from that perspective. Look, it does. I mean, the US equity market is 50, 60% of the global economy or global stock markets. The US is, is such a bemoth economy. And how can you have a portfolio of shares where you don't have any exposure to the Magnificent Seven in the tech sector, for example, uh, or, or, or some of the other huge global brands? You know, look at the pharmaceutical industries uh, as an example. Um, the global banking uh, industry is another example. Uh, uh, entertainment giants like Disney or Netflix. Uh, and instead, you know, I've got exposure to 10 or 7 or whatever it might be, which is, you know, what, a couple hundred thousand people a day watch it. That's right. Let's talk about international markets. And we might get into the topic of emerging markets specifically as well, maybe in a moment's mm. time. What kind of markets out there are widely available for investors to trade? Which ones would you suggest maybe having a look at? No, I think the bigger markets make an awful lot of sense. And we've talked already to the US, and I think the US is, you know, it's been where I do pretty much all of my investing as I have for a few years now, uh, purely and simply because of its sheer scale. Uh, the fact that it is the global engine room, in spite of what some people may feel, um, is, a, is a great place to start. Being from the UK originally, I still have a, a soft spot for UK investments, but I, I haven't traded the UK stock for a really long time, even though I know a lot about the companies and, and what they do. Uh, it's in the wrong time zone for me, but it's also, um, yeah, it's just my interest is more focused toward the US. And I think as Australians, we're quite close to the US um, in terms of the news flow that we see here. Uh, and also, I think the attitude's uh, a little bit different to what it was back in the day when we were more... Um, I guess, orientated around the Commonwealth. So, you know, the big markets around the world would be obviously the US, the UK, which is the FTSE 100, the top 100 companies uh, in, in the UK, the DAX in Germany, although given the fact that now we look at Europe as a, as a, a broader uh, economic community, you could look at the Euro stocks 50, which would give you the top 50 companies in Europe. Japan, uh, which, you know, is still up there in the world's top five economies, uh, would be the, the, the sort of major spots. And of course, China now too, insofar as yeah, it is it's such a, a, a huge, huge economy. But how do you invest in those to make it easy? Uh, and having a brokerage account in some of those countries could be could be quite challenging. I guess the fortunate thing on our platform, we can trade you know, 40, 50 markets globally from, from one platform that's based here in Australia, in Australian dollars, I might add. So you know, that's made it an awful lot easier for people to get exposure to that. And, uh, and I, I don't think investors should be shy of having that overseas exposure either. You know, to the other side of the argument, you hear, oh, there's exchange rate risk. You've got to be careful with that. And well, yes, there is. Um, and, and the biggest exchange rate risk is that you hold a currency like the Aussie, which on a decline in resource prices means that your Aussie dollar buys very little elsewhere around the world. Whereas if you've got overseas investments, um, you know, you can benefit from, you know, some fortitude in the currencies of those countries. That's right. And I think the familiarity for most people too is really gaining because let's face it, you watch Channel 9 in the morning, you're hearing a lot about meta and international companies, not necessarily our local companies. Mm. 
to move forwards from that AB, and I know this is a growing area of interest for you specifically in your trading, and that's not necessarily international markets, but emerging markets mm. specifically. Can you talk to us about what that means specifically and what it looks like? Look, emerging markets would be, it's, it's hard to say this without it sounding slightly condescending, uh, 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 oftentimes th not third world countries, but countries that are coming out of being of a more impoverished background into uh, a more Western uh, lifestyle or, or wealth level. Um, to give you some examples of this, so a dear friend of mine back in the day, a guy called Nicholas Vardy, uh, used to run a fund, Central and Eastern European fund, uh, back in the in the 1990s. Great fund manager, Nick, and, and, and a good character too, I might add. And Central and Eastern Europe was coming out of the doldrums of being part of the sort of Soviet communist era. And those countries like Latvia or Poland or the Czech Republic uh, were all starting to become uh, closely tied to the European Union or indeed joining the European Union. So there was this enormous shift from being communist and, and grey and centrally governed to this colourful world of opportunity created by the West. Uh, and Nick was quite instrumental in investing in, in a lot of those countries, Russia included at the time too, I might add. Um, and, and, and there was a lot of money to be made because, you know, you've got countries, uh, I beg your pardon, companies that, you know, take Pleva, which is a drug company in Central and Eastern Europe, no one would have heard of. Uh, and then all of a sudden it's a major manufacturer of pharmaceutical drugs uh, as it's uh, got access to capital and access to new markets. And if you invest in those companies early on, you know, you can do especially well. So that's a very good example of, of that sort of process. And now if you look at it, those markets are, are more fully valued because they're not new or emerging markets, they're well established. And so the, the hunt then goes for, well, where's next? What are the what are the next places to, to look at investing and where the opportunities might sit? So, you know, to an extent you could argue on, on some metrics that China may be included in those, other other metrics not. You know, countries like India or Mexico or other countries in South America, uh, which you know have vast resources like Brazil, for example, it's a, a huge exporter of iron ore, could create you know good opportunities. The flip side is with opportunity, there's always a challenge. And some of those countries don't necessarily have the most stable government. They have high levels of inflation, uh, interest rates move around. And so there are variables that you have to traverse if you're an investor in those countries that, that perhaps you don't have to if you're investing in your, in your Magnificent 7 NASDAQ listed stocks in the US. So there's, there's a very different landscape and playing field for them, but gee, they can provide some really incredible opportunities uh, for investment. And I think more than anything, uh, Mitch, the reason why those markets appeal is that their performance is usually quite uncorrelated to the traditional markets. And so it gives you a great level of diversification. So if the Dow is having a hard time, um, you know, and we went through the specter of rising interest rates over the last sort of two years in the US, and perhaps we're getting toward the end of that tunnel now. Um, at the same vein, you had a lot of countries in, 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 um, in the Far East, for example, where interest rates weren't going up because they didn't have an inflationary problem. And so their, their stock markets were doing you know, especially well through those timeframes. So that diversification is a huge attribute. You're never going to put all your eggs in that market space because it is typically more volatile. But certainly embracing and having, having some exposure, uh, I think, is a, is a very, very sensible thing to do as an investor if you're serious about working your portfolio hard. Absolutely, indeed. Now, before we go into some maybe trades or, or investments you've made in that space, AB, one thing that springs to my mind as a question is tax considerations mm -hmm. and regulatory issues. Now, I know if you're investing offshore, there's there's obviously a potentially tax implications of that. But a good thing is a lot of these ETFs, which we trade often in the emerging market space, mm -hmm. are issued in the US, which we've got a dual tax treaty with. Exactly right. And it creates um, an opportunity to go to a sort of one shop stop where you don't have to dive in deep and work out which company in a certain economy is going to do really well and others not. You can simply invest in an ETF where it might be tracking the index in that country, it gives you wonderful diversification, it also gives you just one transaction to do, but to get you know, a bulk allocation, if you will, or exposure to a lot of different shares. The tax side of it does become interesting. And you, you're right, we do have a dual tax treaty with, for example, the US. And so one of the services that we provide for our clients, uh, there's a form, it's a W8 Ben form, which is not the easiest. I love those forms. <laughs> used to anyway. Uh, look, I haven't looked at one for an awful long time, yeah. but they, they, they're, they're written by the IRS, the uh, Internal Revenue Service in the US. They're not exactly user friendly. And, and, and we get our clients to complete one of those. We help them do that. Uh, and then all of a sudden, your tax liability 
liability in, in, in the US is, is effectively zero. It's all paid here in Australia, making it far easier to then then trade uh, and invest in those markets without that sort of fear. Equally, as you say, legislation and compliance can be quite challenging too, especially if you're operating in um, some of the less beaten paths. Yeah, we talked about you know Japan, which very clearly isn't an emerging market, um, or Germany, which very clearly isn't, or the UK. So they're very well established. But if you wanted to hold, you know, Thai equities, for example, and the actual, you know, the the the, the Bangkok Stock Exchange has been around for a long, long time. It's, it's actually a pretty orderly and very well run market, but it's off the beaten track for most investors, which makes it a little bit more challenging in terms of where to get your research from, uh, how to get a bead on the economics in that country. Yeah. But long story short is you don't have to open an account overseas with an overseas broker. Just right? open it with us here in Australia, Australia, Australian dollar held account, all your tech stuff taken care of very, very easy. And as I say, access to multiple markets around the world, very, Indeed. very simple. So to get to the nitty gritty of this, mm. AB, some of your trades that you've mm. made, and we can talk ETF specific given that's your, your area of expertise. Yeah, look, if, if I look to views uh, and opportunities there's probably three good case studies over the last sort of 18 months that we could uh, we could take a look you at hit us don't leave us sitting um, here any longer and, and there's a really interesting story between behind all of them um, and I'll start with Mexico uh, and Mexico is an incredibly interesting country you ever spend any time there it's a pretty wild place too oh, yes yeah. uh, you know it has its challenges safety wise sometimes but nonetheless it is an interesting place as is most of South America it's a really cool culture um, Mexico uh, is in a very enviable position in so far as what we saw in the post-COVID world, uh, and, and particularly when events such as um, the Suez Canal became blocked or uh, other countries went into a more harsh uh, regime of lockdown through the pandemic, um, it really strained a lot of supply chains, particularly for big multinational companies in the US. And you think, well, you know, you're dealing with these countries all around the world because you've got access to cheaper labor, it's a lower unit cost for, for manufacturing your goods. But if you can't get the goods and sell them, it's gonna hit your bottom line. And that sort of um, bell went off, I think, for a lot of companies. And this notion now of nearshoring where you move to markets or economies that are closer to you, where you don't have to um, you know, ship things around the world and deal with the, you know, the potential risk of tariffs and things of that nature uh, make Mexico quite interesting. Um, if you think about its location, it's in the same time zone as the US. So you haven't got to get up in the middle of the night to have a Zoom with a factory in Asia to say, where's my stuff? Oh, it's, you know, it's Chinese New Year or you know, the Suez Canal's blocked so we can't put on a boat and get it to you. It, it, it's in the same landmass that you are. Uh, and the US, and I guess no, no political pun meant by this, effectively does uh, have an open border with, the, uh, with Mexico. Uh, but from a trade perspective, it certainly does with the NAFTA, North American Free Trade Agreement. So you've got this ability to be able to move your stuff in and out very, very easily without the risk of tariff in the same time zone uh, without needing to put on a boat. And they're things that are you know, pretty advantageous. Couple that with reasonably high skilled, cheap labor. Uh, and I'm gonna say at the lower manufacturing end, not necessarily at the really high spec end, but certainly at the lower and mid manufacturing end, no brainer. And that's what, one of the things that you start to see in the Mexican ETF, uh, which is a great way of getting a broad diversification to that EEWU, um, has had a fantastic run on the back of that particular narrative. So there's an example of seeing what's going on in the world, trying to get a bead on how companies are digesting what's going on in the world and where they foresee um, that game being played out going forward. So Mexico is a good example of that. Um, India would be a second one. Uh, Indian, uh, India is an incredibly interesting interesting country. My grandfather lived there actually in the 1930s. Uh, he was there in the British Army wow, uh, okay. uh, when, he was, uh, when he was a soldier. And um, fascinating country. And uh, if you look at what's going on in India right now, um, it's the world's biggest democracy. It's going to election this year, and you've had a mandate where you've got around 300 million people that exist on less than five US dollars a day, which you know is obviously a tough ask. It's also got more millionaires than any other country in the world too, which really? is an interesting sort of dichotomy. Very surprising. Um, and some of the, the, the economic policy afoot at the moment is that ability to take people from abject poverty, particularly in the rural areas, uh, and, and, and bring them industrially, as we've seen in China, for example, uh, and also just generally a, an evolution and, and high level of sophistication in the economy. So there, you've got 300 million people whose income is going to jump from, well, it's hardly a jump, but from $5 a day to $10 a day, which is nothing still in the big scheme of things, but it's massive in terms of the quantum. 
what that impact of uh, doubling of income Double, was. Yeah. And so that's that's at the heart of that play. Uh, but also you look at um, India from a cell phone perspective. So India will be the world's largest cell phone market in the next two years. And I'm not talking about high spec iPhone, just a basic cheap phone. So you've got this huge market that's coming online that currently hasn't been online or hasn't had access to be online through telecommunications and technology. Again, a huge springboard uh, for that particular country. So how do you invest in it? Pretty tricky. And you've got countries like, uh, beg your pardon, companies like Reliance, um, which at one point uh, a few months ago looked like it was about to go under and then it's not. And, and, and so stock selection is quite hard. Again, pick up an ETF. PIN is an example uh, of uh, an exchange rate of fund traded in the US, but on Indian equities making it very easy to transact. Your tax is all sorted out with the US as we've already covered and you've got the ability to have exposure to this once in a generation wealth explosion uh, that's Makes going on in easy. that country. Indeed. And, and, and the final one, a little bit um, more sophisticated perhaps, if you take China, I know China's not an emerging market uh, per se, um, but it, if you've got a view that it's, it's going to be struggling on the back of the collapse of Evergrande uh, and the bad debt that's through there. And it's not just the company that's gone under, but it's also the tax revenue that's going to impact quite dramatically, I think, on a lot of local authorities there that make their money from property transactions. Uh, the demand for steel uh, and the knock-on effects of the wealth implosion of people that have paid a deposit or a bond to buy an apartment that they're not going to get. Um, that's going to weigh pretty heavily. And we've already seen in China there's been a slowdown in spending. Uh, people are saving a lot more. There's also higher levels, particularly in younger people, of unemployment um, and a lower consumer confidence on the back of it. And so you think none of that really particularly ogres well for the Chinese equities market. So how can you profit from that? And again, you know, finding stocks to short and trade in China can be quite challenging. Oh, yeah. Um, again, there's an ETF for it, Yang, Y-A-N-G. Oh, that's clever, isn't it? And, Very uh, clever. and that's the bearish geared ETF on, on Chinese equity. So is there a yin? There is a yin as well, oh, which is the bullish okay. ETF. Yeah, so you can do yin and yang uh, and okay. be neutral, <laughs> or you can take a view either white or black, light or dark, and, and go from there. And so there's an example where you can exploit and I use that term carefully, uh, the the movement or anticipated movement you expect to see in that economy is it perhaps does go into a recession and equity markets suffer on the back of it. So three very, very different case studies based on different drivers. And I think it highlights the importance. And, and, and don't get me wrong, any one of those three, they're going to be a very, very small position in your portfolio because they're aggressive and they're quite niche. Um, and really, the big position in your portfolio ought to be in the Plymouth NASDAQ or, or, or S&P because, I mean, they're two markets that, you know, last year the S&P put on 20%, the NASDAQ 42. Uh, this year to date, what are we looking at? Sort of about 6 and 8% respectively yep, year to date for right. those two indices. And, and if you just picked up a, a, an index tracking ETF, you'd be going pretty damn well and then have a little bit of colour around the fringes in some of these emerging market stories if that's something that floats your boat or or in some UK or Japanese or, or European equities. Well, that gives you a little bit of a diversified portfolio, bonds as well. Uh, and it just takes people out of that lane of you know, top 20 Aussie companies, which you know we're the best one in the world. Yeah, you know, We can be patriotic. A business is Australian investment education after all, but how robust is the Australian economy right now and how robust are the Australian companies within it? You know, we had the uh, CBA and Matt Komen come out last week saying, look, the outlook's looking a little more fragile than we'd like. Um, and, and, and that's a stalwart of the index. You know, we've got three of the world's largest exporters of iron ore to China. And if China does go into a recession and cuts down on its steel production, given the millions of empty apartments that are sitting there right now, what does the outlook look like for our mining sector, which I might add was one of our ways of getting through the GFC. And if your portfolio is just focused on Australian equities, that's the risk that you have. And it's a substantial country risk that you're investing in a very small country, both economically and, and, and stock market, not physically, obviously, but you know, from, a, from an economics perspective. And you've got most of your portfolio in that, yet there's this world of opportunity that's far more diversified and potentially far more attractive um, in terms of an outlook that you're missing because you're anchored into your own backyard. So I think there's a huge case for, for international markets, for everyday people, not sophisticated investors, but everyday people to have more of an inclusion than perhaps they do right now. Very nice. AB, thank you very much for your insight today. Cheers. My, my pleasure. Anytime, Mitch.
There you have it guys, make sure you like, comment and subscribe. Most importantly, hit that notification button and we'll look forward to speaking with you next week.